<clears throat> so in our previous lecture, we observed the steady erosion of Imperial China. From the glory days of the Qianlong Emperor to the futility of Commissioner Lin Zexu and his failed war on drugs. From the disastrous opium wars to Hong Xiuqian in his Taiping Rebellion. Remember that uh, great kingdom of peace uh, that he was trying to build for all Chinese people? From the sacking of Empress Dowager Cixi in Summer Palace to the failure of the self-strengthening movement. And of course, the disastrous Boxer Rebellion. Remember that uh, Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists who believed that their techniques would block uh, European bullets. Through all of this, we watched as Imperial China absorbed many blows from outside forces. With the Boxer humiliation deepening the sense of Imperial doom, uh, last minute efforts to reform the Manchu dynasty from within gave way to conspiratorial attempts to overthrow it. Remember during this time, China was controlled by Manchurians, not by ethnically Han Chinese. This was the last imperial dynasty of China, ruled by Manchurians. Manchuria is this area above Korea over here. However, none of these previous rebellions in China were considered modern. Their leaders were either peasant bandit chieftains or charismatic cultists, people like the delusional Hong Xiuqian, and none of them besides the bizarre boxers had managed to join the anti-Manchu anger to the country's growing rage against foreigners. What was missing in all of these late 18th and 19th century insurrections was any effective linkage between rebel demands for such things as tax relief and retribution against landlords on the one hand, and a coherent program for ridding China of foreign dom domination and restoring national pride and dignity on the other. So this is your first term, guys. Sun uh, Gongshan. known as Sun Yat-sen. Uh, I guess that is, is his um, Cantonese pronunciation of his name, or Sun Yat-sen. Uh, in Chinese, in the Chinese um, scholars known him as Sun Zhongshan. Uh, the first modern Chinese rebel to propose any solution to unrestrained foreign predation and deepening domestic disorder was Sun Zhongshan. Um, the first modern Chinese rebel to propose a solution to uh, foreign predation and deepening domestic disorder was Sun Gongshan. And we're going to talk a lot about him. A physician by training, Sun was a native of Canton, also known as Guangdong province, um, where Cantonese or Guangdong Hua is spoken. In English, um, in a lot of English sources, they just say Canton. Uh, on this map, it says Canton. This is actually probably Guangzhou City. Um, Canton is either, when they say Canton, they either mean the province of Guangdong province, or they mean uh, the city of Guangzhou. So it's very confusing for anyone studying Chinese history when you see an English source say Canton. Okay, well, are you talking about the city of Guangzhou, or are you talking about Guangdong province? Um, so he was a native of Guangdong province, particularly Guangzhou City. Uh, this region was one of the hotbeds of foreign influence and resentment against the foreigners was particularly strong here. Yes? Uh, wait, so was Sun, uh, was he a nationalist? Yes, we're going to get into that. There's, we're going to write a lot about, we're going to talk a lot about Sun. It's going to be a lot of stuff. He's a ma major part of this lecture. We're going to write a lot of notes about Sun. He was a nationalist, yes. Um, also strong in this region was the sense of Manchu impotence, uh, the inability to maintain order given the presence of the troublesome foreigners. In the 1880s, as at a time when the Dowager Empress was tightening her grip on the Manchu court, Sun, then just a teenager, went abroad to study. He first attended an Anglican missionary high school in Hawaii. At that time, Hawaii was still a princely state on the verge of becoming annexed by the United States. 
He later pursued a medical degree in Hong Kong, also known as Yanggam, um, where he converted to Christianity in the mid 1880s. While living abroad, Sun was deeply impressed with the administrative effectiveness of these societies. During his residency in Hawaii, for example, Sun first became acquainted with American political ideas, the ideas of the revolution as well as uh, legal institutions, and the American educational philosophy of John, of John Dewey. After graduating from medical school, Sun practiced medicine for two years in Hong Kong and Macau, also known as Almond. Returning to his native Guangdong province in 1893, he grew increasingly disillusioned with the corruption and decadence displayed by the Manchu bureaucracy. In this early stage of his political career, Sun was torn between uh, conflicting reformist and revolutionary impulses, uh, which could be summarized in the question, do we need to destroy Chinese civilization in order to save it? So this question, do we need to destroy Chinese civilization in order to save it? Uh, this was a big question for Sun Zhongchan. Um, he, was torn, he was torn between uh, reforming China, but also uh, he also had these revolutionary impulses. Um, so this was a big question that he was asking himself. To help resolve this mental confliction, he traveled north to Beijing uh, to seek advice from, and counsel from the Hongdang, uh, former commander of the anti taiping military forces. Um, in the 1890s, Li Hongdang was uh, China's foremost advocate of military modernization. His oversight of the self-strengthening movement and his efforts to introduce modern ships, guns, and industrial infrastructure was very impressive to Sun Zhongshan but like his mentor, Sun Guofan, Li believed that the key to restoring China's uh, national wealth and power was to copy foreign technology uh, in order to prevent further foreign insurrections. When Sun Zhongshan tried to convince Li Hongzhang uh, that the secret to the wealth and power of Western nations lay not in their battleships, not in their cannons, but in their commitment to the full development of human talent and capability, the free exchange of commercial products, and the full utilization of the Earth's natural resources, uh, Li simply ignored him. So Li Hongzhang believed that, you know, the reason why the West was so successful was because they had big guns and big ships, right? Uh, Sun Zhongshan believed that it was not these uh, big guns and big ships that made the West good, it was um, their, their political ideas, right, and their freedom of thought. And when Sun tried to persuade Li Hongzhang that the uh, free uh, universal education and study of Western law was necessary to reform China, Li again turned a blind eye. Stunned by this amount of ignorance, Sun decided to return to Guangdong province, uh, where a year later in 1894, he founded the radical anti-Manchu organization called the Revived China Society. Chinese at Xingdong Hui. Um, so this Revived China Society is one of your vocabulary terms on the lecture notes sheet. Um, so this was founded in 1894 uh, by Sun Zhongshan, right? Meeting secretly in Guangdong province, uh, the 112 original members of this society uh, took an oath to expel the Manchus, to restore Chinese rule, and to establish a federal republic 
Western in nature. By 1895, overseas branches of the Revived China Society had been established in Hong Kong and Honolulu, uh, two places where Sun had undertaken his training. At this point in 1895, Sun finally burned his bridges to the reformers' camp. With the aid of 3,000 sympathizers recruited from amongst the returned students coming back from Guangdong uh, to Guangdong province from abroad, and a group of newly converted Christians, as well as support from local uh, societies, Sun plotted to seize control of Guangdong province. However, his plans were leaked to local officials by an informant, which resulted in the death of 48 of his followers. From then on, Sun was a man on the run, harassed by the imperial police and ultimately forced to leave the country. Evading several attempts to arrest him, including an 1896 kidnapping attempt by imperial Chinese agents in London, Sun traveled widely throughout Europe, refining his revolutionary political ideas and seeking financial support for his cause. Ironically, this uh, unsuccessful kidnapping attempt orchestrated by Manchu agents in London made Sun something of a celebrity giving him access to the drawing rooms and pocketbooks of European society. The three principles of, uh, right, so while traveling abroad in um, Europe, Sun also formulated the first known version of what will later become known as the San Min Zhu Yi, or uh, three principles of the people. Traveling abroad, uh, Sun Zhongshan, uh, he formulated these Western ideas for a political system in uh, China known as the Three Principles of the People. Uh, these were Min Zhu, or uh, nationalism, Min Zhuan. For uh, people's rights, and Min Chung, uh, people's livelihood. So, um, nationalism, people's rights, people's livelihood, uh, the three principles of the people of Sun Zhongshan. Um, I know renmin means uh, people in Chinese, right? So I don't know if you guys know RMB, renmin B. Uh, the currency of China, right, is uh, RMB. Uh, so meaning the people's currency, right? Under the first of these principles, uh, which was nationalism, Sun called for both the overthrow of the alien Manchu dynasty and for the final removal of all foreign imperialist footholds in China, a China for the Chinese. Under the second principle, people's rights, uh, Sun called for the adoption of four basic democratic political devices, which is uh, one of your terms. These are popular election. I think we all know what a popular election is, right? So we're gonna write that down. What the first term is popular election. Four basic democratic political devices under the second principle, uh, people's rights, right? Popular election, referendum, Recall, and the last one, People's Legislative Initiative. <coughs> right, so uh, a popular election, I think we all know what that is. A referendum is a direct vote by the electorate on a proposal, law, or political issue. Uh, this is in contrast to an issue being voted on by a representative. A recall election, also called a recall referendum, is a procedure by which in certain polities, voters can remove an elected official from office through a referendum before that official's term has ended. So if someone was in office, um, someone could call to a recall and uh, remove that person from office. Uh, People's Legislative Initiative. Um, in political science, an initiative is a means by which a petition signed by a certain number of registered voters can force a government 
to choose either to enact a law or hold a public vote in the legislature in what is called uh, indirect initiative. Um, he further advocated the separation of five distinct branches of government. And these branches of government are very similar to, um, to our branches of government. He took a lot of inspiration from the US political system. executive branch. the executive branch, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, uh, the police or control branch, and the civil service or examination branch. Um, do we all know what the civil service exams are? Or the sorry, civil service, uh, the civil service branch or examination branch? Civil service exams were exams where it's an examination in ancient China uh, where people would go to um, either local government uh, offices or the imperial capital to take an examination uh, based off of like Confucian ideas and uh, Chinese uh, political, political ideas, right? And stuff like that. And we're gonna go more into that Finally, under uh, Sung's third principle, which was people's livelihood, he called for uh, equalizing rural land ownership and for regulation of the accumulation of private capital. Later, this third principle would be given a more populous spin and would be relabeled morphing into the concept land for the tiller, uh, which is perhaps the best known of Sung's three principles of the people. Initially formulated in 1897, Sun's three principles of the people were later incorporated as the official political philosophy of the Provisional Republic of China. Um, so a provisional government is a temporary government. That's one of your terms here. Provisional government, uh, simply put, is a temporary government. Write that down. Though that government was ultimately short-lived, surviving only briefly from 1912 to 1913, the people's, uh, three, the people's Three Principles today remains the governing credo of the Chinese Nationalist Party on Taiwan, the Kuomintang, or, which we'll get into later. But if you want to write anything down for that right now, you'd say the Chinese Nationalist Party. Um, we're gonna get to the term later, so you don't have to write it down right now. But provisional government is just a temporary government. Yeah. But we'll get to Guomindang later on. While in his European exile from the turn, around the turn of the 20th century, Sun's reputation as a revolutionary benefited from a series of reform setbacks in China. The first of these was the collapse of the 100 Days of Reform, engineered by the ultra-conservative Sun that we talked about in our previous lecture. Uh, the failure of the 100 Days served mainly to underline the futility of trying to reform the Manchu dynasty peacefully from within. If a further display of Manchu incapability were needed, it was provided by the abject humiliation inflicted on China by the foreign powers in the Boxer Rebellion in 1901. As a result of these internal developments, Sun, Sun's prestige grew both inside China and amongst the abroad communities of anti-Manchu Chinese. In Paris, in Berlin, in Brussels, and in Tokyo, Sun began to gain new and willing recruits in his revolutionary cause. 
1904, he changed the name of his organization from the Revived China Society, uh, which is in Chinese is Xing Zhong Hui, uh, which suggests a peaceful reform agenda, to the more revolutionary term Zhong Guo from Meng Hui, or the China Alliance Society, which is one of your terms. So the reason why you have to know this, uh, this was 1904, is because um, when he changes his name, the name of the society to the uh, China Alliance Society, right, in 1904, Sun Zhongshan, when he changes the name, it totally changes um, his tactics, right? So he's no longer looking to reform China, now he's looking to have a revolution, right? Between 1906 and 1911, the Tong Meng Hui attracted several thousand members and affiliates. It was also in this period that Sun began to uh, put his revolutionary ideas into practice, as he organized 10 separate popular uprisings in southern China. There was to be no going back for Sun. He was now a dedicated revolutionary. Unfortunately for Sun and his followers, all of these insurrections ultimately failed, uh, though the final uprising, which took place in Sun's native city of Guangzhou, northwest of modern Hong Kong uh, in Guangzhou province in April of 1911 did generate some uh, public sympathy. As a historical note to this event, Sun's insurrection of April 1911 was later memorialized by a large concrete obelisk arrest, erected in one of the Guangzhou main, Guangzhou's main public parks known as uh, Huanghua Gang, Yellow Flower Mound, honoring the memory of 72 revolutionary martyrs who died in Sun's attempts to seize the city. This monument today remains a major Cantonese municipal landmark. Meanwhile, beset by rising revolutionary violence, the Manchus belatedly <laughs> introduced a series of domestic reforms, halfway measures as well as more radical ones, in an attempt to stave off the ultimate inevitable, inevitable disaster. Between 1905 and 1908, Empress Dowager Cixi, now in her 70s, uh, gr grudgingly agreed to implement a series of constitutional reforms, which uh, included things uh, such as the final ab abolition of the much despised eight-legged like essay, um, establishment of provin provincial political assemblies, the reorganization of the imperial bureaucracy, and the introduction of public participation in local administrative affairs and financial planning. I'm gonna write this down since it's part of your notes. So it's very important that you realize that Cixi tried to reform society um, before the Manchu Empire or the Qing Dynasty finally collapsed. Although these um, reform efforts were ultimately futile, uh, they, she did attempt to do something, right? So I think it's important to understand that. What does the second thing say? Establishment of provincial political assemblies.
right? So the first would be the abolition of the eight-legged essay. This would be like me saying that you know you guys don't have to write essays, five-paragraph essays for your binder projects anymore, right? That's kind of what this would be like, right? If I was to say, you know, no more five-paragraph essays for you guys, right? That's what happened here. The eight-legged essay uh, was a style of essay in imperial examinations during the Ming and Qing dynasties in China. The eight-legged essay was needed for those candidates in the civil service test to show their merits for government service. Often focusing on Confucian thought and knowledge of the four books and five classics in relation to government ideals. So this eight-legged essay uh, was an essay that students uh, would take in ancient China that was based off of Confucian ideals. The establishment of provincial political assemblies um, you're thinking about a decentralization of the government. You think about like uh, states, right, and local governments. That's kind of what's being created there. Your organization of the imperial bureaucracy. Obviously, uh, the bureaucracy was very corrupt in the summary organization. Um, introduction of public participation in local administrative affairs and financial planning. So now the average person, your your average person, is able to take a part in the governing government system, right? Any questions about what I wrote on the board? Yeah. What does that say on the last line? Like uh, affairs and financial planning. Affairs. Yes. So administrative affairs. So like government stuff. Oh. Yeah. I thought there was a T. I'm sorry. No worries. Yeah. Um, in some of these respects, she was borrowing the thunder of Sun's populism. But the reforms were a classic example of too little, too late. Decades of Manchu self-indulgence, negligence, and corruption were now exacerbated by a series of natural calamities. Between 1909 and 1911, the, Ch the Changjiang, uh, or Yangtze River, and Hanjiang, or uh, the Han River, both underwent severe, repetitive flooding and uh, bringing famines to millions. A morally and fiscally bankrupt regime could offer little in the way of meaningful relief under these circumstances. And tens of thousands of people perished, close to a million thousand, uh, close to a hundred thousand rebelled. In the year of 1909 alone, 113 uprisings were reported throughout the country. Most of them spontaneous revolts by hungry peasants. A year later, the total jumps up to 285. Much of the violence occurred in the newly flooded areas along the lower and middle reaches of the Changjiang, or Yangtze River, and uh, the very same regions where the Haiping Rebellion had enjoyed their greatest success half a century earlier. Anti-Manchu resistance also gathered strength in China's newly established provincial assemblies, whose locally prominent delegates were increasingly resentful over Manchu efforts to impose centralized control over valuable local industrial assets. Indeed, it was a rebellion by the uh, Sichuan Provincial Assemblies uh, against a Manchu scheme to nationalize the country's railroads in 1911 that foreshadowed the final ultimate collapse of the dynastic system. Ironically, when the end finally came for the Manchus, it was triggered not by a massive popular insurrection, uh, but by a single unintentional urban bomb blast. As central government troops were being uh, mobilized to suppress the Sichuan Assembly's railroad rebellion, revolutionary allies of uh, Sun's Tong Menghui, who had infiltrated the ranks of local imperial army in the city of Hankou, hastily pushed forward their plans for an armed uprising. On October 9, 1911, a revolutionary bomb went off accidentally uh, and prematurely at the headquarters, headquarters of Sun's military allies inside the Russian concessions at Hankou. Shocked by this rebel bomb blast, the Hankou police mounted a raid on the Russian quarter where they arrested 32 of Sun's supporters and seized a sizable cache of weapons and explosives. Even more important and devastating, they seized documents and identified a large number of underground revolutionaries amongst the garrison's officers and men. Their identities revealed the compromised conspirators decided to strike first. The rebels who numbered perhaps as many as 2,000 fighters first attacked the offices of Manchu Governor General at Hong Kong. Caught completely by surprise, 
The governor panicked and fled along with the local garrison commander. Encountering little resistance, the rebels gained effective control of the city by noon the next day, October 10, 1911. When the fleeing Manchu government urged foreign diplomats to send gunboats to bombard the revolutionaries, some foreign consultants flatly refused. Others declared their political neutrality, still others uh, simply ignored the request. Thus began the Chinese Republican Revolution of 1911 with its principal architect, Sun Zhongshan, who resided thousands of miles away. In folklore, uh, the China, China's Xinhai Revolution, um, the seizure of Hong Kong on October 10, 1911, is celebrated in Taiwan today as Double Ten Day, or Shuang Shi Jie, uh, China's National Day. So I'm gonna write this down because this is part of your notes. Xinhai Revolution, um, October 10th, started on October 10th, 1911. It's also called, uh, it's, it's, so in Chinese it's Xinhai, Philippine, so named for the, uh, the date of the uprising on the Chinese lunar calendar. Um, so this is double 10 day. It's also called China's National Day. October 10th is China's National Day, or Double Ten Day on uh, Taiwan. In reality, however, the final Manchu collapse was a protracted affair, taking place over a much longer period of time. And it was as much the product of decades of festering foreign wounds and domestic political problems as it was a result of any revolutionary plan and popular uprising. Indeed, it is ironically emblematic of the sudden and unexpected outbreak of the Xinhai Revolution, in which Sun himself was in the United States at the time on a fundraising mission. Apparently, he was as surprised as anyone by the suddenness of the final Manchu collapse. With foreign governments now sitting, uh, sitting there doing nothing, city after city, province after province, declared their independence from Manchu rule. By late November of 1911, three-fourths of China, China's provincial assemblies had succeeded uh, from the Manchu Empire. This is one of your terms, right? Yuan Shi Kai. We're gonna talk a lot about it. Meanwhile, in a desperate effort to stave off total collapse, the Manchus tried to persuade their recently retired Northern military commander, General Yuan Shikai, to assume overall command of what remained of the Loyalist armed forces. Yuan's Northern Army, or Beiyang, had originally been organized and trained by Li Hongzhang during the Taiping Rebellion. And it was the best equipped, most modern military force in all of China. So if you were to write anything about General Yuan Shikai, you'd say that he was a northern military commander who had the most modern military force in all of China. And who was recalled from retirement by the uh, Manchu government. But Yuan Shikai nursed a grudge against the Manchus. Just three years earlier in 1908, a group of scheming Manchu court officials had forced him into retirement. Still seething from this insult to his pride, Yuan Shikai was in no mood to do the Manchu's bidding. But he was a clever negotiator, and instead of refusing outright, he dictated a set of strict conditions for his return to military duty. His terms included, amongst other things, granting himself full power of command over the entire Manchu army and navy, and a substantial enlargement of the imperial military budget. The man was looking to increase his own power. 
with few if any viable options remaining to them, the Manchu regent, Prince Jun, acting, a man acting on behalf of the six-year-old child emperor, Hu Yi, uh, remember Hu Yi from our previous lecture, uh, he agreed to Yuan Shi Kai's terms. On October 27, 1911, Yuan was appointed commissioner in full charge of the Imperial Army and Navy on October 27, 1911. But he was still not satisfied, and he now upped the requirements yet again. He demanded that the regime also agree to promulgate a full set of constitutional principles, and that he himself should be named the emperor's prime minister. Clearly, Yuan Shikai had something more in mind than merely leading troops into battle. By the end of November 1911, all that was left of the once mighty Manchu court was the figurehead boy emperor Hu Yi and his regent Prince, uh, Prince Jun, his mother Princess Jun, and a retinue of loyal family retainers were all that was really left. And if you remember from our previous lecture, the powerful Dowager Empress, uh, the Dowager Dragon Lady Zixi, had already died three years earlier at the inception of Hu Yi's taking to the throne in 1908, shortly after the death of the Guangxu Emperor and just one day after she succeeded in installing the three-year-old emperor, Hu Yi, to the dragon throne of Imperial China. With Yuan Shi Kai now in effective control of what remained of both the Imperial Army and the Chinese government, Yuan cautiously negotiated with Sun's revolutionaries about a possible power-sharing arrangement, right? So Yuan Shi Kai now decided maybe we should power share with uh, Sun Zhongshan, Sun himself had read about the Hanko uprising in a Denver newspaper during his time in the United States. Choosing to remain abroad temporarily, he continued his fundraising drive. A month later in November, he left the United States for France, where he redoubled his efforts to secure Western diplomatic recognition and financial support. Returning to China in December of 1911, Sun arrived just in time to preside over the birth of the provisional Republic of China, right, in 1911. So I know one of your terms is um, the Nationalist Republic of China. Um, the Provisional Republic of China was founded in 1911, right? Um, and we all know what a provisional government is, it's a temporary government. Meeting in Nanjing on December 29th, representatives of, this new of the new regime elected Sun as provisional president by a near unanimous vote of 16 to one. Three days later, on the 1st of January, 1912, Sun was inaugurated. Although he had declared his willingness to share power with Yuan Shi Kai, Sun's selection as provisional president deeply offended Yuan. He had uh, political ambitions of his own, and Yuan ordered his lieutenants to break off all negotiations with the Republicans. Recognizing that the provisional republic was extremely fragile, and that it could no longer, could not long survive without the support of a Moa army, Sun now sought to appease Yuan to bring him back into negotiations. First, he tried to minimize the importance of his own election as provisional president. He even stressed to Yuan, to Yuan's intermediaries, that he uh, had agreed to accept the provisional post only in order to preserve the post, the regular presidency for Yuan himself, right? So he tried to mitigate his own election and tell Yuan that I'm only holding this post because, you know, I want to give it to you. But Yuan was still not convinced by this rather half-hearted explanation, and he threatened to order his generals to oppose the new republic and to opt instead for a constitutional monarchy. So Yuan wanted to form a constitutional monarchy similar to that of Japan, uh, which modeled their government after Germany, Germany's constitutional monarchy. Right, uh, but uh, but Sun Zhongshan wanted to create a uh, dem uh, democracy or republic similar to that of the ideals of uh, of America. Right. In early January of 1912, Sun proposed an arrangement that would ensure a mutually satisfactory transfer of power. In exchange for Yuan's public confirmation of the Manchu dynasty's abdication and his personal declaration of support for the new republic, Sun would resign as provisional president. 
uh, thus clearing the way for Yuan to accede to that highly coveted post. Um, satisfied with these arrangements, Yuan agreed, and on January 30th, the Imperial Regent Prince Jun advised Princess Jun Pu Yi's mother that there was no feasible alternative to imperial abdication. So Sun did, in fact, uh, resign from office and give the position to Yuan Shikai. Uh, Yuan Shikai becomes this kind of like dictator, right? Uh, she thereupon summoned Yuan to the palace, uh, her voice heavy with emotion. She announced, I leave the various matters to your judgment and have no requests other than the preservation of the dignity and the honor of the emperor. Two weeks later, on February 12th, the abdication was publicly announced. An agreement among the parties to decree provided that the child emperor, Bu Yi, would be given an annual allowance of four million taels of silver and would be allowed to live indefinitely in the summer palace, along with his mother and the retinue of personal attendants. And with that, the 268-year-old Manchu dynasty came to an end. As one of their first official acts of governance, the Republicans formally moved the, se the seat of the Chinese national governance from Beijing, uh, meaning northern capital, to Nanjing, uh, meaning southern capital. With the abdication now official, Yuan Shikai formally announced his support for the new regime. One day later, on February 13, 1912, Sun Zhongshan fulfilled his part of the bargain by resigning as provisional president of the republic. One month later, Yuan Shikai was sworn in as president. Oddly, however, Yuan took his oath of office not in Nanjing, uh, the republican seat of government, but in Beijing, a symbol of imperial China. At this point in the early spring of 1912, there was a single nominal Republic of China. So this is uh, one of your terms, right? When was the Republic of China formed? You'd say 1912. So I think it's the, uh, on the second page, National Republic of China, 1912 was formed. But there were two rival groups of officials vying for supreme authority, each with a profoundly different vision for China's future. Yuan Shikai quickly betrayed democratic ideals of the revolution. His actions sparked local revolts. After the general died in 1916, civil war broke out. Real authority fell into the hands of provincial warlords or powerful military leaders, which happens quite frequently in Chinese history. Um, I can name many times like the Warring States period, Spring and Autumn period, Three Kingdoms period, uh, the period of the Eight Princes, I can go on and on. Uh, China is actually a very culturally diverse place. Uh, it's not really like a one cultural kind of thing. I know we all think it's like Chinese is one culture. It's not really like that. Um, they ruled, and these local warlords ruled territories as large as their armies could conquer. In 1917, the government in Beijing, hoping for an allied victory, declared war against Germany. Some leaders mistakenly believed that for China's participation, the thankful allies would return control of the Chinese territories that had previously belonged to Germany. However, under the Treaty of Versailles, the allied leaders gave Japan those territories. When news of the Treaty of Versailles reached China, outrage swept the country, and on May 4, 1919, over 3,000 angry students gathered in the center of Beijing. The demonstrators uh, spread to other cities and exploded into a national movement. And this is called the May 4th Movement, which is one of your terms. Uh, it was in protest for the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the reason why they were protesting was because um, the Treaty of Versailles gave the territories in China to Japan instead of giving it to the Chinese government. Yes. Uh, D E R S A I L L E S. You're welcome.
because the Treaty of Versailles gave uh, the the colon the European colonies in China, like such as um, like uh, I think the German colony in um, Shandong Province, uh, they gave that to Japan instead of giving it to uh, China, right? So they gave the territories, the colonies in China, they gave it to Japan instead of giving it to China. That's why they didn't like the Treaty of Versailles because they want Chinese want their own land, right? They don't want that land to be given to Japan, right? Um, workers, shopkeepers, and professionals uh, joined the cause. Though not officially a revolution, uh, these demonstrations showed the Chinese people uh, commitment to the goal of establishing a strong modern nation. Sun and the members of the Kuomintang, or Nationalist Party, which won her terms, also shared the aims of this movement, right? So we're going to write that down. Yes, of the May 4th movement. Sun Nongshan and the Kuomintang shared, uh, they shared these, um, these resentments, right? They shared the feelings of the May 4th movement. Sorry? For both of what? Like, yeah, you can put that in for Sun Rongchan and for Kuomintang, you can put that in there for that. If you want to write those down as votes for the oh, votes right now. I'm writing down Nationalist Party of China right now. Wait, does this go under the Nationalist Republic of China? No, it goes at, goes under Kuomintang, which I'm going to get into. Also called the KMT. Uh, I think KMT is like an abbreviation of the Cantonese pronunciation or uh, Kuomintang or something like that, right? Um, but Kuomintang is the uh, is like the correct opinion pronunciation of the Mandarin of the Mandarin pronunciation, the correct opinion usage of the Mandarin pronunciation. Uh, KMT, I guess, would be an abbreviation of the Cantonese pronunciation, right? But they could not strengthen central rule on their own. Many Chinese intellectuals turned against Sun's belief in Western democracy in favor of Lenin's brand of Soviet communism. In Tiananmen Square, separated from the Forbidden City or Gugong by the Tiananmen Gate, was the site of many political activities during the 20th century. Early in the century, May 4th, 1919, thousands of students gathered there to protest the terms of the Versailles Treaty. Uh, the May 4th movement was born on that day. Uh, 70 years later, in 1918, uh, 1989, sorry, uh, students once again gathered at the square to demand political reforms. Uh, shortly after the anniversary of the May 4th movement, uh, thousands, perhaps a million people gathered on the square on June 3rd, 1989. Uh, the Chinese army was ordered to clear, clear the square of all protesters. Uh, thousands were killed or injured. Uh, this is me. At the, in the Forbidden City when I was in China. Yes. Isn't it like a really controversial topic? What happened to like the Yeah, it's very controversial. The reason why it's controversial. Uh, Didn't the government say that nothing happened? Yeah, the Chinese government says that. But we'll get into that. You know, um, we'll get into Tiananmen Square in a later lecture. Okay. But I was there. I went there. Uh, how, long, how many minutes do you have? Four minutes? Okay, I'm just gonna go into this and then we'll, uh, we'll see how far we get. In 1921, a group, of, a group met in Shanghai to organize the Chinese Communist Party, or Dongguo, Gongchangdang, uh, which is one of your terms. Uh, yes, 1921.
It's also called the CCP or the CPC. Um, it was founded by Maltodon, uh, which is another one of your terms, right? So Maltodon uh, was the founder of the Communist Chinese Party or the CCP or the CPC. Um, I think when we when the party was first founded, uh, this was the correct uh, this was the correct abbreviation. This means Chinese Communist Party. Uh, later on, somewhere along the road, we decided that this was not uh, acceptable and that this was the acceptable one. Uh, regardless, it's called Bong Bong Chang Dang in Chinese. Um, the, the name in Chinese hasn't changed, just the abbreviation has. And um, I guess a, the um, nationalist anthem of the Chinese Communist Party, Mao Bong Chang Dang, Mao Xin Dong Guo, means like no, uh, no, no Communist Party of China, no new China, right? Uh, was actually a modification of a. Uh, nationalist song, Mayo Gomindang, Mayo Sinjong Wall, which means uh, Mayo uh, means uh, no new, uh, no new China without the uh, Nationalist Party, right? So the Nationalist anthem of Chinese Communist Party today, Mayo Gong Changdang, Mayo Sinjong Wall, is actually a copy of a Nationalist anthem, Mayo Gomindang, Mayo Sinjong Wall, right? I think we have only like a few minutes left. So we're gonna end it there, right? We're gonna continue it. We're gonna continue it. Yeah, we're gonna continue this um, next time. And we'll start with the, we'll start with explaining again, we'll go over Chinese Communist Party and Nationalist Party, and then we'll go on from there, okay? And then uh, and then we'll go over the lecture notes, right? But save your seats, guys, uh, wait for the bell.